Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer and the doors of perception. The good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. Toxicology. Astro seismology. Magnetism. The dark side. Genetically engineered potatoes. Planetoid. Planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we transfuse your brain with weird and wonderful science. I'm Ian Wolfe. On this edition, Kelsey Picard describes her career from chocolate to plant science. But first up, here's news of vampires. Vampires and leukaemia. Leukaemia is cancer of the body's blood-forming tissues, including the bone marrow and the lymphatic system. Researchers from a dense university hospital and the University of Southern Denmark have examined the descriptions of the victims of vampires in three gothic vampire novels written in the 19th century. They suspect the writers were inspired by the symptoms of real people suffering from leukaemia at the time. The researchers studied The Vampire, written in 1819 by John William Polidori, along with Carmilla, published in 1872 by Irish writer Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu, and of course Bram Stoker's Dracula, published in 1897. The researchers created a data collecting sheet and proceeded to go through the novels line by line to collect the symptoms and how long they lasted in all of the fictional victims. To test their hypothesis, the symptoms described in the novels were compared not only with leukaemia, but also with other diseases. The Vampire by John William Polidori is the transition of vampires from folk tales into gothic vampire literature. And there's almost no description of the symptoms of the vampire's victim other than pallor and blood around her mouth and chest after death. In Carmilla by Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu, three young women two of whom are vampire victims, are described with very similar symptoms and progression of disease. The symptoms include persistent exhaustion, fever, pallor, difficulty breathing, and chest pain. At least two of the girls note a red mark on their chest, presumably skin bleeding. The symptoms increased in number and severity throughout the course of the disease, lasting between six weeks and a few months. However, only one woman died, after six weeks of illness. In Dracula by Bram Stoker, the first victim, a young woman, Lucy Westenra, has previously suffered from anemia, but is now suffering what is described as clearly another disease. Her course starts with malaise, paleness, repeated infections, and increasing fatigue. She develops two persisting red marks on her neck, and she quickly deteriorates, with headache and confusion, and even becomes delirious. Lucy is described as bloodless, but not anemic, by three people, two of whom are doctors. And so she's given four blood transfusions with immediate improvement. Many of the symptoms repeatedly go into remission, only to return after a few days. Lucy died after 42 days of illness. Another young woman, Wilhelmina Murray, and a young man, Jonathan Harker, are described with symptoms mimicking Lucy's. They share the core symptoms of malaise, paleness, fatigue, anorexia, difficulty breathing, and weight loss. The trance-like or delirious state in the final stage of Mrs. Murray's course mirrors the cerebral affliction in Lucy's disease. Mrs. Murray's and Mr. Harker's symptoms are, however, only vaguely described and non-fatal. The list of symptoms is cumulative over time, with core features of pallor and lethal outcome preserved in all three novels. Additional symptoms also seen in leukaemia, malaise, anorexia, fatigue, difficulty breathing, fever and weight loss are seen in both Carmilla and Dracula. This supports the idea that the symptoms were caused by the same underlying disease. The number and complexity of symptoms increase from the earliest to the latest novels, with the greatest increment from nearly no symptoms in The Vampire in 1819 to the elaborate descriptions in Carmilla in 1872 correlating with the advances in medical knowledge of the time. 
The description of Lucy Westenra's symptoms in Dracula in 1897 mirrors a textbook description of symptoms among patients with acute leukaemia. The authors compared the victim's symptoms with other 19th century diseases to see how well they matched. They found that the victim's symptoms didn't match well with diphtheria due to a lack of coughing, pellagra because the victims were well nourished, anemia because the victim was described as having already suffered anemia and that this new illness was quite different. Thrombotic microangiopathy, because the victims would have died more quickly, especially after transfusions. Acquired bleeding disorders were ruled out, because of the lack of profuse bleeding and the benefit from transfusions. And finally, myodysplastic syndrome was ruled out because the victims died too quickly. The researchers point out that Bram Stoker's brother was a famous brain surgeon. This gave Bram Stoker access to patients' medical histories and discussion with his brother about medical information in his novel. The descriptions of Lucy's cerebral symptoms matches those seen in people suffering untreated acute lymphoblastic leukaemia. Patients suffering acute lymphoblastic leukaemia would have been brought to the attention of Bram Stoker's brother Sir William Thornley Stoker and possibly into his care. The authors conclude that victims in Gothic vampire novels from the 19th century could very likely be inspired by real-life acute leukaemia patients. Except for the bite marks on the neck. The paper was titled Malignant but not Maleficent. Acute Leukaemia as a Possible Explanation of Disease and Death in Vampire Victims and was published in the Irish Journal of Medical Science. Let no one leave. Watch out! They may be hovering over you. Or you. Or you! The danger stalks through the night. No one is safe. Their fury would follow us to the ends of the earth. No, we must destroy them all together. They shall be found. I hereby summon to this place next week every person within the sound of my voice. You shall be judges of this eerie conspiracy. Here we shall meet Lionel Barrymore, Elizabeth Allen, Bela Lugosi, Jean Herschel, Lionel Atwood. Mark of the Vampire. You're listening to Ian Wolfe on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. From chocolate to botany, Kelsey Picard is a plant scientist and geneticist doing her PhD at the University of Tasmania. She's also a science communicator, involved in many projects, and a co-host with other women of STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering and Maths, of the podcast, That's What I Call Science. We spoke by Zoom, and I began by asking Kelsey, are you a botanist or a horticultural scientist? Well, I probably identify more as a botanist. I'm very interested in horticulture, but I don't have a background in the application to agriculture. So my training was more pure botany, so identifying plants, but actually more genetics and biochemistry. So what's happening inside of the plants. And how did you come to choose botany? It was actually just luck. 
to be honest. When I finished high school, I really didn't think I wanted to go to university. It really intimidated me. I was the first in my family to go to university. So I didn't have any role models that I could sort of ask about the experience. But when I left high school, I was working at a chocolate factory, which sounds like the dream job. And it was for a while, but I really missed learning. I got really bored of the same thing every day. So I went to university halfway through my first year. And that meant that I had limited selection of what subjects I could take because I was starting halfway through. And one of the subjects I could take was botany. Now, I took it because I didn't have very many options and I really didn't think I would enjoy that subject. I thought it was going to be boring. I only wanted to study animals and humans, but it completely changed my whole path of science. It was the best subject I'd ever taken. It opened my eyes to the whole amazing world of plants and um, how complicated and interesting they are. So yeah, it, that's how I ended up studying botany. And what's your favourite part of it, do you think? What is it? Is it? You were talking about the complexity and the fascination. What is it that draws you into the plant world? Well, I don't even know where to start. I guess there are so many things I find so fascinating about plants. I guess the fact that they've evolved to live off of just sunlight and water, like that's incredible. We wouldn't be on earth if it wasn't for plants. We wouldn't be able to breathe the oxygen that we need. They have to withstand whatever environments they are existing in. So they can't just get up and walk away if the climate is changing and or you know, they don't have a food source there or they're um, shaded by another plant. So the fact that they can adapt so well and quickly to their environment, I find really fascinating. The way they reproduce is something I'm particularly interested in. I, so I study flowering. I'm very interested in how we get all of our food from plants as well. So yeah, I, I mean, I could go on forever about why I love plants. <laughs> and where does your research focus at the moment? My research focuses on flowering timing of legumes. So I'm looking at what controls flowering in legumes and particularly what makes a plant stop flowering. So what's the process going on in the plants there? Do you get some that flower all year long or do they have a favorite season? So plants usually flower at a certain time of year. That time can vary between plants depending on what sort of pollinator species they might be after to come and visit their flowers or what environmental conditions they're measuring to determine when to flower. So plants are constantly measuring the environment around them. They're measuring temperature, rainfall, daylight is a a big indicator. And so they're constantly reading the environment around them to decide when the optimum time to flower is. Because I've seen there's, well... I have an interest in in fruit trees and carnivorous plants and things myself as well. And sometimes when you're looking at them online, the sales, they talk about ever-bearing ones as opposed to ones that only flower in spring or summer or winter. Ever-bearing. Yeah, perhaps they have been bred in a way that they don't have as strong flowering signal requirements so that they don't need, for example, a frost before spring to trigger flowering that might have been bred out of them. That's exactly the kind of thing that we're researching. What do the plants need in in order to decide to flower and what genes are controlling that process? So once we have a better understanding about that, for example, with legumes that we're studying, we can then target those genes for breeding programs and try and get plants that are gonna produce food for longer periods or even all year round, potentially. I mean, that's one of the things, a lot of our crops are just annuals, aren't they? Yeah, a lot of them are annuals. Yeah, there's a few reasons we would use an annual over a perennial in crop plants. So perennial is when you'll get repetitive growth year after year. An annual will usually only live one year, maybe two, and have one reproductive phase. Most of our crop plants are annuals because we like to harvest them all in one go. Um, If you think of big commercial crop farming, so wheat or many, many grains, we've run huge combine harvesters basically over these crops once they're finished and so we can collect all the seed in a big batch. If we're talking about perennials or plants that live for longer periods like apple trees, that requires more hands-on harvesting, which isn't probably as suited to our mass production that us humans need nowadays. So the, the perennials are really only good for people growing food for themselves? Yeah, but there's a lot of interest in 
using perennials and crop production as well because they require a lot less um, input and uh, maintenance. If you're able to grow a plant for many years and still get production from them, um, you're going to get less disturbance in the soil that is better for the general ecology in the field. So people are still interested in turning or converting annual type crops to perennial type crops. Yeah, there's variation within different plant families, so that's definitely a research topic as well. But yeah, at home, I guess it's it's convenient when you're growing in your veggie garden to not have to keep sowing things year to year. I know that, you know, for example, strawberries, you can leave them in the ground and they'll come back the next year and that's quite convenient, yeah. So for listeners who've, they've obviously, well, everyone's seen flowers, but not everyone knows how they work. We know bees come and pollinate them. But what's actually, what are the pollinators doing? Yeah, um, so plants produce flowers as a way of reproducing. Basically, a plant will decide to flower when it, it's basically decided that it's the end of its life, or for an annual especially. It's spent a bunch of time photosynthesizing, gaining energy from the sun, and it's ready to put all of those energy reserves into a flower and produce seeds. So a plant will make a flower and the flowers are basically the uh, reproductive organs of the plant. So there'll be male and female parts within the flowers. Sometimes the male and female parts are on separate flowers or even on completely separate plants, depends on the species. But those little pollinators, so uh, things like bees, birds, bats, lizards, will come and visit flowers that are attracting those specific pollinators to spread pollen around. So basically pick up pollen by visiting a flower. Usually it's attracted by something like a nectar source and it has to be, be a reward for the pollinator. Otherwise there's no real reason it would come to visit. So if there's nectar in the flower, they'll come to eat the nectar and they're basically accidentally picking up the pollen as they go and then they'll move to another flower to eat the nectar again and spread the pollen. And does your love of plants go outside the lab? Yeah. Absolutely. I have numerous houseplants, more to, than I should count. I really enjoy growing my own food at home. So I grow, have a, a couple of veggie gardens and flowers. I like to grow flowers. Whenever I'm out on a bush walk, I'm constantly stopping and looking at the plants around me. I'm completely plant obsessed, <laughs> to be honest. And you're quite into science communication. So you've been involved with Science Week and Young Tassie Scientists. And, and what's your podcast? The podcast is called That's What I Call Science. And how do people find it to listen? So you could search That's What I Call Science or That's Science Taz. Basically, wherever you listen to podcasts currently, we're basically on any podcasting streaming platform. We also have a website called thatscience.org. We're on all social media under at That's Science Taz. So, yeah, every week we release a, an episode not too dissimilar from yours, Ian. Uh, I've been listening today. Really enjoy your podcast. Thank you. Lots of great topic ideas I've sort of written down since listening <laughs> to your podcast. But we're trying to elevate the voices of women in STEM and also other diverse minorities in STEM because the public really has a perception of what a scientist should look like, and that's not usually the case. So there is definitely a gender disparity in science, and there are many reasons behind that. But we want to make sure that young people are seeing role models that look like them, that they can identify with who are successful role models and try and elevate their voices through this podcast. And how did you come to join the podcast? Uh, well, I guess it started from previous science communication activities I was doing. So you mentioned Young Tassie Scientist. Have you had a couple of other Young Tassie Scientists on yes. your show before? So I started that way, visiting schools, communicating to children, which is super rewarding, but I also recognized a lack of communication to adults. And so some friends and I, the host, Neve Chapman, she started a podcast and um, I joined along as a natural scientist host. And so it started from there. Basically, we wanted to be able to communicate science topics and issues to adults as well and also get so yeah, younger people interested as well. So I guess there's quite a large science communication cohort in Tassie, which is really special. And so all kinds of things are branching out from that work. 
Wonderful. And so for the young Tassie scientists, were you visiting schools before you started doing the videos? Yeah, that's right. We used to go into schools. We would do road trips all around Tasmania in August during Science Week and visit regional schools and local schools in Hobart and tell them all about the science we're doing. Just try and get them engaged, be able to see that, you know, science is a, is a viable career for them. Yeah, and it, that was super rewarding and also a really great way to see Tasmania. I'm not from Tasmania, um, from New Zealand, but yeah, getting to travel around and, and visiting all the schools was a really great opportunity for me as a communicator. And do you have any suggestions for people wanting to get into the science of botany? Well, I mean, if, if you're already sort of inquisitive about the world around you and interested in how things work, uh, it's a pretty easy path to stay in science, I would say, because you're just going to be genuinely interested in what you're learning every day. I mean, at high school, I, I never knew that I would end up doing a PhD in plant science. I didn't really enjoy school very much. Science was my best subject, mostly because I was just the most interested in it. So I was willing to sort of engage with the content and then by accident, I guess I did better in those subjects. But yeah, I guess something that I would like younger people to realize is that even though you don't maybe don't know what you want to do when you're young, you'll figure it out along the way. And I think there's a lot of pressure on young people to sort of know very early on what they want to do. And then it feels very scary to then be making those decisions about which subjects to choose and whether to go to university or not. But if you're genuinely an, an inquisitive person and interested in the natural world around you, you'll be drawn to science and it, it should all really work out <laughs> that way. And I guess people who have gardens at home can sort of make more scientific observations, maybe even experiments with the plants in the garden. Yeah, people can do science every day, basically. You don't have to be a scientist to be a scientist. You you know, if you're growing food at home, you're doing your own science experiments. You might realise the potatoes don't grow in one spot as well as they did last year in a different spot. So you learn from that and then you change the method next year, you know. Yeah, or you, you notice a pest has arrived and it's on your plant, so you have to figure out how do you get rid of that pest and what are the consequences of getting rid of it. And, yeah, gardening has is just full of science. Yeah, and I, I think people don't really consider that they probably think that scientists are smart and it's almost like this elitist view of scientists, but it's really just... People are constantly doing science in their everyday life. It's it's not something that you have to go to university to do. Yeah. Would you have any final words for the audience? Well, I guess if you're interested in hearing about other cool science that's happening in Tassie, you can check out Young Tassie Scientists. That's what I call Science Podcast. I'm also involved in a Science of Bear blog. So a friend and I are interested in, well, are big fans of beer. We're also really interested in how beer is made. So we've got another science communication branch, which is called Science Made Bearable, B-E-E-R-A-able. Yeah, so, yeah, check them out. Awesome. Well, Kelsey, thank you very much. Thanks. That was Kelsey Picard, PhD student from the University of Tasmania, talking about plant science. You can see the video of this interview and many others with James Hayes about odour, Ian Bryce about masks, Bonnie, Kirsten and Martin about the search for life on Mars, Sylvia Vicenzi about brain development, Dipon Sarkar about food microbiology, Liam Burt about synthetic chemistry, and Amy Edwards on the science of cuddling animals. On the Diffusion YouTube channel, subscribe and like at youtube.com slash c slash Diffusion Radio. Mr. Speaker, this is coal. Don't be afraid. The Don't be scared. Won't the treasurer you. knows the rule on crops. It's coal. There's no word for coalophobia officially, Mr. Speaker, but that's the malady that afflicts those opposite. Coal being an important part of our sustainable and more certain energy future. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Are you a scientist, artist, biohacker, or maker who'd like to be interviewed about your work? Would your company like to sponsor Diffusion? Send your contributions, opinions, helpful suggestions and donations 
to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate the show on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolf. The news music was Rhinos Theme by Kevin MacLeod of Incompetech.com. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia to 28 stations on the community radio network, including Radio Blue Mountains 89.1 FM in New South Wales, 8 Triple C in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2 MVR in Ambaka Valley, 3 MVR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia, City Park Radio 7 LTN in Launceston, Tasmania, and 2 XFM in Canberra. Diffusion is now narrowcast on Indigo FM 88 in northeast Victoria. Diffusion is syndicated globally on the National Science Foundation's Science360 internet radio station and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com. And check the website for links, photos and videos about this week's show. If you enjoyed this show, then you can explore more than a thousand previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com, where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Join my patrons at patreon.com slash Diffusion Radio. Make a donation through paypal.me slash Ian Wolf. Support Diffusion by buying from the affiliate links at diffusionradio.com slash support. I'm Ian Wolf. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. Science is fun. It helps you to learn, to know and to appreciate. When you study science, you may go on field trips. You discover the marvelous interrelationships between all living things. You learn to read the history of the Earth as it is written in rocks and fossils. You find out what makes things tick. Everything from a molecule to a living organism. In the study of science is found the most useful and satisfying knowledge of man. Knowledge of his physical world, its past, its present, and its future. And in your moments of relaxation, now and in the years to come, you will find the study of science leading you into fascinating pursuits. Photography. Collecting. Why study science? Study science because you will find in the study of science a richer, more rewarding life.